to Fitnosophy, build your body, realize yourself. I'm your host, Gaia Domenici. I have a PhD in philosophy, I'm a certified nutrition and health coach and a personal trainer in the making. This is my podcast, where we'll be discussing how body, mind and spirit are all connected and how their balance defines our health. If you're passionate about training, nutrition and overall optimal performance, then you're in the right place. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, all right. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks. Thanks a lot for joining me today. How are you? Good. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Gaia. Oh, that's good. What time is it there? It is 10 a.m. here in uh, not so sunny Oregon, even though it's July. So. <laughs> yeah. Same in London. Yeah. yeah. yeah Other than it's sure. 10 past 6 so, yeah, p.m. Um, yeah. so, uh, what's been your morning like so far? Tell me. Uh, well, I, I started my morning off like I usually do. Um, I definitely am a believer in a strong morning routine. Um, I usually wake up and I, I do red light therapy first thing when I wake up, when I get the coffee going and I take a quick walk, cold shower and some breath work. Um, that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Did a little bit more breath work than usual to prepare for this uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah. Uh, I really look forward to hearing, you know, more about that. So would sure. you like, yeah, I mean, would you mind sharing your story with, with our audience? So who are you, where you come from and what, what have you done so far? <laughs> and Sure. Yeah. Gladly. Well, yeah, my name's Taylor Thompson. Um, I grew up on the island of Kauai in, in the, the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and yeah, I guess with, with my pursuit in the fitness world, um, it all started in a friend's garage, <laughs> like many others, especially, you know, with teenage boys, we started working out together in the garage probably more for vanity reasons to become more attractive and, and whatnot. But um, eventually uh, that naturally evolved into kind of finding that, that uh, enjoyment out of working out itself and the, uh, the consistency and the, the constant of always being able to, being able to have those small wins in the, uh, in your training. Um, so I, I joined the military when I was uh, 19 in 2007. And so I, I did a lot of training that was more endurance style training early on. Um, and eventually I caught the powerlifting bug. Uh, I started to, uh, I started powerlifting and strength training. Um, I started a powerlifting team when I was in the Navy. So that was probably my first introduction to coaching other people and you know uh, enjoying the exchange of information with my peers and you know oh try this or i just read this bit of information so we got to do this in the gym now um yeah that, that sounds familiar like it's something that everyone yeah everyone kind of uh, gets through i guess yeah yeah i'm sure you can relate to that yeah. as well <laughs> <laughs> um so I really caught the powerlifting bug in a big way, um, almost became somewhat obsessive with uh, getting really, really strong. Yeah. Um, and that lasted for the better part of a decade. Um, I did a few competitions throughout that time. And wow. I found, yeah, just a few. I wasn't very comp uh, competitive, um, but um, eventually I did get more competitive. I I was very fortunate to organically come across a, an amazing mentor and a team. I was in San Diego at the time and I was training at power. Uh, uh, what was it? World's world's gym. Oh, wow. in San Diego. <laughs> and uh, I started training there and I, at the time I was really into the conjugate method and West side barbell yeah. yes. and actually geared powerlifting. Yeah. And so I had the chains and the bands and, we, and which everything. Lift, which, which lift um, was the, your strongest one? Where you were? Uh, 
the deadlift. Yeah. You know, I got these long, lanky arms and uh, kind of a shorter torso. So my my bench was rubbish. We don't <laughs> have to talk about that. Um, and the squat was uh, something that I really had to work on too because of my levers, um, yeah. which I, I ended up really putting a lot of work into that. Um, but I did I did find this this community of lifters there that caught on to what I what I was doing because they, they saw me lifting with the chains and bands and came over and uh, kind of started asking me questions and then <laughs> I, I, I started training with them and um, it was amazing there you know they were some really strong people men and women in this group and I found out that um, the the leaders of the group. Um, the people who were coaching the team was, uh, at the time, AJ Roberts and, uh, Gracie Vanessa. Wow. Uh, AJ's from your side of the pond, I believe. He's, he was, um, a world record holder yeah. in, uh, in geared powerlifting. He had the all time, uh, world record total for, uh, the 308 weight class. Um, so I just completely got consumed even more so with powerlifting. And, wow, um, that, that is so cool anyway. So, yeah. yeah, it was really amazing to be around um, just, you know, such high performing people. Um, yeah. I guess the I, I learned was like super high because you, you, you were, you wanted to, to do well with them. We wanted to succeed, wasn't it? Like, a- absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure you can relate to when you put yourself in a, a community of, of people that are like minded and you develop a new standard for yourself because you're held accountable to that team. Um, So I I did enjoy that and it taught me a lot. Um, However, there, there came a point where I was, I was gaining a lot of body weight. And (laughs) I guess it's um, fairly common among the, you know, the power lifters. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, and it's necessary to be competitive or, or yeah. to, to make it in that sport. And, you know, you're constantly pushing yourself to the max with, with um, the strength threshold. Um, and I think for me at that time, uh, the obsession of powerlifting, I started noticing that there was a bit of an unbalance um, in other aspects of my life. And, uh, you know, nothing against powerlifters. I think powerlifting is great, but it can consume you in a way that is not always good for promoting balance and health. Yeah. You know? And how about um, your joints? <clears throat> Have you ever had any joint injuries or issues at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, at first, it was more chronic inflammation. Right. And, you know, kind of, I found myself in this perpetual loop of, setback after setback i'd get strong and then i'd get injured and i get strong and and i also found that i was fairly injury prone and that Mm. (laughs) you know i probably was never going to become an elite power lifter even with the amazing community that i surrounded myself with um and my health really started to suffer uh i tore my trap off of my neck i popped a hamstring and eventually um I started having a lot of pain in my hips every morning I would wake up and it just felt like my hips were rotting. Like they, you know, it was just excruciating. Yeah, that must and, be um, yeah. yeah. So I went to the doctor and was recommended that I get hip surgery. Wow. Um, and how old were you? Sorry. I was 25. Come on. Fairly hip young. surgery at 25. Like, uh, well, yeah, maybe 20. Yeah. 25, 27, somewhere in there. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, very um, good. yeah. So, you know, me being stubborn as I was, I ignored <laughs> the doctors. I kept pushing. Um, and then something really kind of scary happened. I started having heart issues. Wow. Um, and I started, I started to have palpitations and um, I went into the doctor and I wound up wearing a EKG, a portable EKG for a month. Wow. Yeah. Um, the doctors told me I would have to go on beta blockers and, and other oh heart medications. Um, at the time, I was 280 pounds. Okay. 
So uh, I kind of, during that time, spiraled, you know, uh, started becoming more and more burnt out and kind of just depressed with how things were going. This kind of conundrum of like still wanting to be an elite power lifter and, but realizing that everything else is falling apart. Um, I also had a failing relationship at, at the time that, you know, um, wasn't, wasn't good for me. So that's, um, at that point, I did something that I never thought I would do. And I stopped everything. I stopped going to the gym, stopped moving, essentially. And, uh, and things got worse, the pain got worse. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just not in a good place. So um, something about me is, you know, I, I mentioned I grew up on the island of Kauai. Uh, I also grew up with a very outdoorsy lifestyle. I, from a young age, I started hunting and fishing. Wow, and, that is you know, so cool, yeah. Yeah, so I had, a, I had developed early on a, an intimate connection with my food source and my, my true cost of existence and, and the natural world. Yeah. So during that time, I started, you know, to approach my health in a different way. I started to, you know, eat better foods and, you know, I was focused more on quality rather than quantity. And, <laughs> um, and then I went to the woods. I went out to the wilderness for a month by myself. Wow, that, that sounds amazing. Like, you know, an experience I, I would be, you know, very much willing to do, but <laughs> it's not very practical for, for me because I grew up in, in a town, like by the seaside, but, you know, still in a town. So I, I couldn't survive one day in the woods. <laughs> but, but I, I, I bet you would surprise yourself. I bet you. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. can't recommend it enough. Um, so, Yeah, I, I went out to the woods for a month and I brought my bow and my fishing pole. And wow, that's I, so cool, yeah. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that time. It was such a profound time. It was such a paradigm shift in my way of thinking and approaching my health. I started to have a really intense inner dialogue. Um, you know, I'm sure you can relate to that too, just any fitness pursuit or whether it's you know, extreme sports or just a holistic, healthy lifestyle, you have to have an inner dialogue and you have to al allot yourself time with yourself to reflect on uh, what's important. Um, so I came out of that experience um, knowing that I needed to give myself time to reflect. And also something profound happened. It was, it was, It was when I was able to turn it all off and just be present and be in this present state of being in my body. And I realized that the mind and the body are one thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, I came out of the woods. I started making better choices. I started implementing these practices into daily life and finding kind of more of a sustainable way of approaching my health and fitness in a way that, you know, was enjoyable and really just adopted the lifestyle. Um, so. Oh yeah. So what, what, what did you, I mean, yeah. What did you do and uh, how has your life changed after um, that experience? Because I think our audience will be much interested in, uh, in knowing this about you. Because you, sure. what you do is very, very interesting, and uh, Thank you. no, I mean, yeah, and uh, and by the way, <laughs> today is the re the official release of your ebook, isn't it? Uh, it is. Yeah. Yes. So uh, thankfully. Yeah, I, I, I really, <laughs> yeah, I look forward to reading it. You know, because oh, I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't <laughs> wait for it, really. So go, go ahead Thank and uh, yeah, tell us what you did. Yeah, so and that, that ebook is really kind of the framework of everything that I, I started, all the changes that I started making during that time. And so, you know, I learned that, like I said, the body and mind are the same. So mind, mindful practices and body practices are the same thing as yeah. well.
And right. I, if I may add, add something, I, I would say that spirit is also part of the equation because, and, and then we, we yes. could talk about that, but that's something that is somehow overlooked when we talk about body and mind because usually people put body and mind together or as opposites, but they usually forget about the spirit. Then we could yeah. discuss you know, what we mean by spirit but you know whatever we want to call it that's uh, reality i guess and we, it needs to be included in the um, in the system too but anyway i mean go absolutely. ahead absolutely <laughs> and this is why i was so excited to talk with you today that on your accolades phd in philosophy <laughs> oh my gosh my yeah, favorite things <laughs> i've never dealt with any of these you know in my <laughs> in my research cuz uh, you know like in academia you you really come go beyond like after you so once you you've got your degree and you reach a certain you know level of um, freedom then you might mm -hmm. be entitled to you know to deal with more interesting things but mm -hmm. as long as you're within then you need to really you know do academic stuff which i enjoyed i, yeah. I, I yeah uh yeah i don't really regret any of, of it it was yeah. quite fun, but not as fun as talking about this, obviously. Yeah. Well, now you get now you get to blend that with your passions, right? And, exactly. And the, that. Yeah, exactly. That's the, what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I just not to side rail too much. I completely um, resonate with that. Um, just a little side note, and I don't think I've mentioned this on my Instagram at all, but I'm I'm a wildlife biologist as well. Wow, so, that's so cool. Um, yeah. Merging that as well. At the same time, when I tell people what I do and for work, you know, they kind of look at me like, <laughs> really? Like, and when I tell them it's, it's still just a job at the end of the day, they look at me like I'm yeah. a bit of a, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, well, but when um, you, I mean, everything, everything comes together when you, when you put everything together. Right. So, so yeah, I, I, started, I started implementing... Um, what I learned out by spending time in nature and that's to be in the body. Um, so I started implementing lots of routines and as I like to say, like lifestyle hacks, how can I, how can I feel like I'm out in the woods every day in that present state of being in my body? So practices like uh, breath work, uh, you know, grounding, just moving more throughout the day. Um, you know, even if it's a quick, brisk walk or you just break out in some random movement um at a random time of the day and um get inside your body yes. you know and and so um in the ebook i i base a lot of that type of work as the framework and like the the basic minimum requirements that you need to just increase your low stress activity and uh have a higher output while also addressing the spirit and the body and the mind mm -hmm. all, all at the same time. So it becomes more of a lifestyle than I love it. working out. Yeah. Yeah, I really love and, it. Um, yeah. And I guess what transitioned, what, what, what really did it for me to, to realize that I needed to share it with everyone else um, was actually shortly after um, my mother had a, a, a minor stroke. Okay. Um, that left her temporarily, luckily, mm -hmm. paralyzed um, below the waist. And um, so she was my first client. Mm -hmm. And um, great news, she's doing amazing today. And she's the best client I've ever had. And she's lost weight. And I'm so, so just, glad. Yeah. Oh, and it's just, you know, like when when I saw that, it just even thinking about it now i get a little bit emotional you know um you know that that's it, kind of interesting because my mom has had a similar um experience where she she didn't have a stroke but she had she was diagnosed with um coronary heart disease even though she never wow. smoked or anything and that's when you know everything clicked in my mind and i changed completely my career and I became a, you know, a nutrition and health coach and then a PT because that, that yeah. was the, you know, the alarm basically that raised. Uh, yeah. Raised, yeah. Oh, so that, moms, moms are sacred. 
<laughs> yes, yes, they are. Oh yeah, mm. they're the salt of the earth. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, thank you for sharing that because. Yeah. <laughs> well. So. Yeah, I, after that, after seeing the impact that I had, you know, with her, and um, and I kind of realized I needed to share this with as many people as I could. So I started training friends for free, naturally, and <laughs> uh, and it evolved into what it is today, where I have you know a few clients, and I'm working on expanding that to help more people. That is so cool. So would you like to say something more? Like, would you like to go a little bit into detail regarding your um, protocol and your training programs? So how, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how, you know, just uh, from your pictures and posts on Instagram, I mean, like, it's like amazing. Like, you know, <laughs> that you do, yeah, everything looks so cool so like wow these guys oh awesome. my gosh <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah. you so much i had the same exact experience when i came across your page I, <laughs> me and my fiance i was like look at this look what she's doing <laughs> you know it's it's yeah. so cool to see other people sharing their passion and uh yeah. and just yeah i love it so um yeah so i guess when i when i first start working with somebody i I basically give them what, what I, the ebook is essentially the result of um, the framework that I give my clients in the beginning when they first start working with me. Yeah. And um, I, I have to say to most of my clients, you know, I guess my niche, the people that I, I'm working with are people who have, have been in a similar experience as I have. Generally, they're, they have a history of training. Um, and they reached a point of burnout and um, are just looking for something to, to give them that, that feeling of, um, of, you know, health and, uh, you know, developing a sustainable practice that is enjoyable and efficient. And, um, and so that the, what I tell all my clients um, when they start working with me is for the first two weeks, just apply these protocols. Um, and, and like I said, I base a lot of that off of the blue zones, okay. um, which are the areas of the world where there's a disproportionate number of centenarians or people that live over the age of 100. Um, and they all share, you know, a few things in common. One of them being that they are moving all day long. Yeah. Um, and they're participating in, in low stress activities all day long. So they're working with their hands. They're getting up and down off the floor. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are sitting, uh, are floor sitting cultures. Um, so there's just more movement throughout the day. There's not all the stagnation that we have in the West of sitting at a desk, looking at a computer screen, watching Netflix, all of these <laughs> things that just... Yeah. Just cripple us. Blue you know? lights all day long, like yeah, yeah. People bad and yeah. So, some of it when I when I explain it to them may sound a little woo woo and esoteric, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the yeah. long hair doesn't help either. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but I I try I do my my research and I try to provide, you know good science that has been vetted that supports these ideas. Cause yeah. recently there has been a boom in, um, and a, a lot of the research supports idea, the, um, the health benefits, never mind the anecdotal mindset benefits and everything, but the actual physiological changes that you can make through practices like breath work or yeah. grounding or, you know, yeah, yeah. meditation. Um, so, um, one thing that I have everyone utilize, and I can't take credit for it, it's a uh, very well-known Ben Greenfield yeah. um, uses uh, a protocol that I think is so efficient because anybody in the West can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, yeah. yeah is. I knew we were part of the same tribe. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a huge fan. I love what he does. And um, the strike stroll shiver protocol is something that I think 
everyone can use, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I use him as a resource in my ebook and I point everyone towards that book for that reason too. Yeah, but, yeah. Cool. you know, like I said, even if you have a, a normal, you know, corporate job, you can still wake up in the morning and take, you know, have your, your coffee, your black, coffee to to, uh, boost your metabolism and you know raise your internal temperature and then go on a brisk 10 minute walk if you can make it 30 or 40 45 minutes that's great and you know Um, you don't even have to leave the house because like you know like uh, sometimes it rains and but you you don't have to go outside because steps count even if you take them you know in place it's not the same it doesn't have the same benefits on your health maybe in terms of um, hormonal you know release because you might feel happier if you're outside because outdoor mm-hmm. just feels better but that's no excuse like you know like saying okay i've got no time or like the weather is awful or yeah you don't have to leave the house you can just you know i don't know find a nice place in your house like a room where no one else is and you you can listen to a podcast and just just move just walk that, that's what yeah. I'm doing, you know, during this lockdown, basically. Like when I couldn't leave the house or, you know, like uh, that, there are literally no excuses not to move, I think. And, Absolutely. Uh, it's just yeah. a matter of balancing things out and uh, putting everything together in one's schedule, one's own routine. And, and I guess mm-hmm. that's maybe what you do as a coach. So you, you actually help people you know um, come yeah you you help people come up with a with a routine that works for them just absolutely uh, uh, in which they can incorporate those healthier behaviors which they might Mm -hmm. not be aware of so that's your maybe your your task to raise awareness and then design you know something that really works for them Mm-hmm. Um, yeah awareness yeah. and education and just you know having a coach who's invested in your success that is going to make the small tweaks with you to, to make it work for you specifically you know the, the yeah. specific person so yeah um, as you said everyone can do it like there's no there's no real excuse not to because you can wake up five minutes earlier 10 minutes earlier you can you know drink your coffee you can walk it's nothing strange it's nothing you know out of ordinary in there that you ask to to do right mm. yeah and you know like that's that's the magic i i'll tell you know i have a few clients they can't walk even outside in the morning because of where they live or it's just you know um it, it's more difficult or they're you know on shift work yeah um, so it becomes more difficult to you know do yes. that so any any movement first thing in the morning in a fasted state is a potent cocktail for boosting metabolism and, you know, burning, uh, you know, adipose uh, yeah. fat tissue. And um, so any, any type of movement, yoga, uh, you can use, I love using the animal flow uh, okay. techniques. Um, yeah, those are wonderful. And, and I, I use them a little differently than their intended use, but, you know, um, you know, something like that. And then of course the shiver, the, uh, the cold therapy is yeah. exercise in itself. It's, it's a low stress hermetic yep. uh, stressor that induces a metabolic response, activates autophagy, which yeah. we know is, is linked to longevity. And, yes. And I'd love to get into that with you too and, and yeah, talk about yeah, all will. that. Um, yeah, we will. We will. <laughs> we, I'm sure we can get into, you and I can get into some some uh some rabbit holes in that subject yeah totally um, and if i mean if we run out of time today we'll do another one because there's so much to talk about really so much to talk about so yeah yeah let's absolutely. try to, to fit in as much as we can <laughs> and then yeah. what's, what's left let's just schedule right. another one yeah um yeah. so yeah and yeah. um, so you, you were saying that basically your program um, is for people who used to train anyway and uh, just burned out or just got stuck in their life and they need to kind of reset themselves. So, um, or, I mean, yeah. what, if, what if someone is a beginner, like willing to train like you, um, would you how would you adapt your program? Um, mm-hmm someone like that because i guess it's not like you know i'm imagine i don't know i imagine i'm a new 
someone who has never trained before and I want to get fit. Right. And I don't even know, you yeah. know, like uh, how to lift weight or anything. And, and then I'm told, okay, wake up, drink a black coffee and like, you know, do some uh, sort of activity for 10 minutes and then cold, cold therapy. And it's like, okay, let me right. slow down. maybe. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's the beauty of coaching is, you know, uh, like you said, it, it not not one training philosophy or diet or anything works for every person. Right. And, and I certainly have a a spectrum of clients that are at different points in their, in their experience base. Um, uh, And I I want, you know, I I said that because that's generally who's attracted to me in the content that I'm putting out, Um, but I want to help everyone. I only have one requirement when, um, when somebody comes and they wants to work with me and that's just that they are in a place to create change in their life, you know, and, and, um, yeah, that is, that is really it, that they are 100% committed to bettering themselves so that they can go then share that with the world and, 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 uh, spread the love. Right. (laughs) I love this. Yeah. I I really love this changes. Yeah. Yeah. So some of my clients, you know, it's more habit based in the beginning. I think that the mindset practices and the habit, uh, you know, identifying unconscious behavioral patterns, um, things of that nature are really need to be stressed in the beginning. I try to give them a protocol that's easy to follow and work with them in the beginning just to get some immediate results and, and get them their energy levels up. Um, uh, but yeah, um, in terms of training wise, um, yes. you know, yeah, it, that's, I, <laughs> that's what I want to know about most. Uh, right. If I have somebody who's come to me, who's never done a squat mm. or a bench or a deadlift, um, I actually will spend more time, um, doing, uh, analysis of their, their, uh, physiology and movement patterns. Oh, that's so, yeah. So I try to figure out firstly, you know, through zoom or I do have a few hybrid clients that are in person and online as well. Um, I'll do a lot of work on identifying the PASIC and tonic muscles and imbalances and just giving them really easy, uh, to follow activation drills and mobility drills to do. And, Once we establish that, then I try and improve their movement patterns and work into the more, you know, functional, uh, at, usually start with more functional full body yeah. exercises, you know, squat and the deadlift and the, the hip, all the hip hinges and all that. Um, I, I, sh- I do stress that in the beginning, you yeah. know, working, t- working towards that. Yeah, because um, those are functional movements above, above all. That's something that mm-hmm. people sometimes forget about because they always think, okay, these are movements, you know, that you do in, in the gym when you lift and it's just, uh, I don't care about, you know, looking uh, better. I don't care about getting muscular. Or, but no, but this is not true because uh, as we'll see, you know, yeah, I mean, shortly, <laughs> this, like, this is actually, this is actually a more functional component, which is connected to longevity and an overall better health. And I guess that's right. what, what's important to emphasize uh, with clients, because most of them do, don't know about this, and they think it's all a matter of aesthetics or just performance. <laughs> But it is not because that's that's got a lot to do with life, with better quality of life. Right. So, yeah, and so I really love this when you when you said that. Absolutely, and I'm I'm I, I have a feeling that you might you know resonate with this as well. But you know, firstly, it's important to you know get used to activating the right muscles and learning the movement patterns, the brain, the mind and body connection needs to happen first, right? Before, before focusing on volume or periodization and all those things. So, um, and my opinion is, you know, quality over quantity. Like I learned after my transformation was that, you know, 
it's very important to, um, to address the whole system from the inside out. Yeah. And then when the whole system is running properly and, and firing correctly, everything else falls in line. Like, you know, I, I tell my clients, like, you know, one day you might want to join a powerlifting competition or you might want to squat double body weight or something. But if you, if you aren't internally, if everything isn't working, you know, properly or like, uh, you know, optimized, then you're not going to get there as quickly and you're, <laughs> it's going to be a lot more painful. So uh, I agree, uh, yeah. focusing on health, uh, and longevity, I think. And this has been my realization too after that transition is when I've been called to pursue the, the more performance side of things, it just comes much easier now. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm stronger than I ever have been in that way, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's where I start usually. Wow, that, that is so cool. And uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's very cool. And uh, in terms of actual program, like you know i mean sets and reps and mm -hmm. exercises if you want to say anything i i mean i'm really eager to listen to what you've got to say because it's i find it very fascinating so the more you thank can you say yeah <laughs> well and I, i'm really excited to hear your your opinions of this as well and have a, a back and forth um share ideas here um in terms of the strength training and uh, you know, building muscle. Um, I, I still believe in simple periodization, you know, uh, periodization and adaption. It's, it's all the same. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, you know, unless somebody is really uh, um, chasing a performance goal. You know, it's like, if you're doing more every week, you're going to get better. You're going to get stronger. Yeah. You're going to build muscle. So I, I utilize, a range of different techniques there. Um, there's certainly like what I think is most optimal while, while still balancing everything else. Um, and that generally is just like, can be simple strength training, uh, program that, you know, starts out with the acclimation or accumulation of volume. Um, and then maybe like more volume and then eventually we can peak strength or we can you know, address all of those things on a weekly basis in different types of exercise, different types of workouts to just kind of, uh, address everything on all fronts, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, I still, I still believe in strength training. Um, I, I still believe in the barbells, the dumbbells, the kettlebells, everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and I utilize, you know, a lot of simple periodization techniques that are kind of more power lifter esque, as you could say. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I, I, I like utilizing, uh, a lot of AMRAP sets as well with some of my clients. And then, uh, usually there's like a more functional training day as well. That's kind of everything, you know, uh, circuit training with strength and, and kind of just a fun workout too, you know? Uh, yeah that so. is so cool and um do you also coach them um, on nutrition or do you leave it like do you just give them advice or do you normally help them design a proper meal plan um how do you cope with that um so i i i do i do a, a pretty flexible approach with nutrition i i think it is important to I think everyone should count their macros at least once in their life. Um, <laughs> you know, um, at least to have I, an idea of what they are, because most people don't even they can't even tell the difference between macros. Oh, it's amazing! It's amazing to watch people too who are, you know, there's a lot of like uh, perpetual or just chronic under eating in a lot of cases, and yes. then obviously the the other spectrum overeating yeah. on the. Uh, the carbohydrates and fats, especially. Yeah. Um, so I try to have everyone do at least a week long food log in the beginning. And, uh, I use, I use a, uh, software that allows us to, uh, for me to deliver my programming through trainerize. Uh, you may have heard of that, uh, software. 
um, where I can connect to my fitness pal and yes. track their, their, the, their yeah. food. Mm-hmm. Have you, have you used that? Or? I use my fitness pal. So, because you can, you can see what they, what they log on the, on their diaries. So you can, uh, actually, yeah. Check them. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, yeah. I think it's it's easier for clients as well because it's less stressful. They just need to to log everything, and then you'll do the job. So they don't have to um, to account for anything more than that, basically. So, right. If they yeah. if they if anyone can do it for two days, they can do it for a week. Um, yeah. Some some people have them go longer if they enjoy it, um, <laughs> and if they stick to it, <laughs> you know, then. Uh, depending on where they are. If we got a really solid week and we, and I know exactly where they're at and I can establish a baseline, yeah. then I may transition to more portion based mindful eating. Yeah. Um, and, and then remind them every now and then be like, how many grams of protein do you think you ate today? You know, like, yeah. um, do you remember what that looks like, you know, in terms of, uh, just eyeballing it. So I, I always start there. I think, you know that, that, that's that i mean that's really cool because sometimes i mean there's a friend of mine and um, she went to a nutritionist uh because she wanted to lose some weight right and mm-hmm. this person yeah this person didn't even uh, you know ask her to um, to track her food so she had no idea you know what what her baseline was and mm. you know she just gave her a diet like, okay, so you don't really, you don't even know how many calories you need to maintain, you know, your, your body weight. So yeah. how can you, you know, how can you just uh, be given a diet, like a random diet? And, and right. people, they, they don't even go to coaches or nutritionists and they just try to, you know, to design their own like a uh, diet or meal plans and they just base them on the those very general guidelines that they can find online but you they might not apply to you especially if you've been dieting for a long time your mm-hmm. maintenance ba- baseline might be much lower than it should be so you need to bring it up before you know bringing it, bringing down. it down yeah and uh, and that's something that should be stressed a little bit more in the um, I guess even in the mainstream, you know, fitness culture, because that's something that a lot of people don't know. You know, when I mm-hmm. search Instagram, I just, uh, you know, look, I just scroll down and I read, you know, all sorts of stuff. And uh, there's some people like, yeah, I'm going to start a new diet, 1,400 calories from tomorrow. You crazy? Like you're starting a diet with just <laughs> yeah. two weeks, like uh, you know, you're going to go down to 1,000 and then what? You, you're going to stab yourself. Oh, yeah. it's so prevalent. I mean, uh, I'll try not to rant there, but, you know, <laughs> the perpetual just crash dieting and even the, you know, I mean, we're doing a 30-day squat challenge because it's <laughs> fun and improves mobility. But the, the, yeah. the programming out there, too, that's just like, yeah, beat yourself up and don't eat anything for 30 days and then what happens after that 30 days right Um, it's still such a prevalent thing and I don't understand it and well I guess you know it's the it's the quick it's the quick uh pill right that yeah that's like a um, direct correlation between like food and weight gain like you know that people think okay if I if I overeat I'm gonna get fat no if you if you overeat you're gonna store more calories which might be used as energy to build muscle a part yes. of it will be stored as fat but that that's part of the process that's normal and the same when you want to lose fat you just need to be in a caloric deficit however it doesn't have to be that drastic you don't need to to lower your calories that much and the more muscle you carry the more you need to eat but people don't really seem to understand that and then on the yeah. other and, and on the opposite hand, you ha- and you have those uh, people who, you know, mostly overweight, who are like, uh, okay, I'm going to go to the gym, have a workout, so I need some extra calories. And then they, they just, you know, eat some candy yeah. bars. Or like, and, it, and that's equally wrong. Like, you know, they're like... Uh, right. Uh, these are just two and there's, Yeah. There's so many nuances to get to get stuck in and there's so much information out there, you know, this diet versus that diet and, you know, or if it fits your macros versus this or that. And, and, um, 
it's so easy to get caught up on the minutia, you know, when yeah. it's, it's really simple. If you start with macros, I always have everyone start there. And then if they're interested in a diet and I do share different diet, fad diet ideas and what the health benefits might be yes. of each. Um, if, if someone's interested and I try to push people towards a, you know, uh, a diet that suits them too. Cause not everyone can eat keto not everyone you know can not everyone can eat do well on a plant-based diet um um, there's a you know it's it's a bell curve there's a few people a small population that does really good with this diet and a small population that does good and everyone else kind of needs some some variety you know yeah yeah um you know i I think you don't know this but i was vegan for a long time actually for five years yeah and I was pescatarian for 10 before going vegan. 10 years. Wow. Was, so yeah. basically for 15 years, I didn't eat any meat. You've got some skin in the game then. You can talk yeah. on that. Was that yeah. <laughs> and no, but seriously. Yeah. And uh, no, I mean, I made a video and um, in my previous episode of this podcast, I talked about that a bit. So if my um, audience want to know more, they can just um, look back. Uh, <laughs> to those uh-huh. videos, so yeah, I'm it. gonna cut it short. But <laughs> the, the <laughs> thing is, my, my health, was, you know, was totally wrecked, and um, I couldn't gain any more muscle, and I couldn't recover basically. And uh, wow. yeah, and the thing is, I was very, you know, cautious with my macros and micros as well. Yeah. And, but the thing is, you know, the rate of absor- absorption doesn't really reflect the actual, you know, the actual absor- like uh, the actual bio- bioavailability of most nutrients. So you, you think you're absorbing more nutrients than you actually are because right. um, everyone's system is different. So everyone has different exactly. weight. So yeah, so you, you, so you don't know. And plus I have a very, you know, severe IBS. So I'm mm. I'm sensitive to most plant-based food now. I I, I have to to follow a strict paleo diet with some uh, dairy and uh, some grains, but not like nothing fancy, you know. Like um, yeah, it it sucks. Like you know, we 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 had some takeaway last week for our wedding anniversary, and it took me like three days to feel better, and it was nothing fancy, oh. was just some Turkish food and uh, some sushi. But because of what they put in the sushi, you know, like um, additive, right. I, I got wow. so bloated. And uh, but anyway, it's fine because I know what it's like. But that was just to you know to to endorse your um, when you were saying that like not everyone can do well on a plant based diet or on a keto right. diet. I tried a keto diet for six months last year because mm-hmm. I read so much about all the you know health benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end it wasn't that beneficial for me like you know it was okay right. but because I mostly train for hypertrophy I like my my training was like my my performance was bad like was suffering too much so right. I started that during a um, strength cycle so I was doing pretty well because uh you, you don't really need carbs if you train for strength. You might, I right. mean, as long as you've got enough nutrients in your body, you might not need carbs. But when right. you increase your reps and you really need, you know, that glycogen to be replenished as fast as possible, and then I, I couldn't cope with it anymore. But, yeah. but I know about a lot of bodybuilders who do really well on a keto diet. So I, Certainly. I mean, yeah. And there are studies showing that actually glycogen can replenish you know itself in a short time like in 24 hours that was mm-hmm. never the yeah. case with me so maybe it was my genetics maybe it was you know my i don't know everyone's different so right uh, and there's the gluconeogenesis as well yes. right where you can and some people may be able to do that better um exactly, yes. and congratulations on your anniversary as well that's oh thanks that's <laughs> great <laughs> yeah, thank um you. that's so interesting though i i've had pretty much the same exact experience um where i i i can relate to you i i'm gonna just take a wild guess and say you've tried all the diets and all the training programs because that's yeah, what we do we're yes. <laughs> we're self-experimenters and we you know it's uh, almost sometimes it can be an addiction it's like 
what's the next thing, you know, I want to, I want to try or learn. Um, but I, I think we've both probably come to a homeostasis where we realize after you've tried everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, but so. yeah, I mean, like there's some really interesting data coming out on the genetic influences of dieting. And again, that's, there's some nu- nuances there because the epigenetics. As well. The gut microbiome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, for me too, it's, I, I still sometimes will do somewhat of a ketosis diet, but I'm always cycling carbs and I I do believe in nutrient timing as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it can be very useful, um, for insulin sensitivity and all those reasons. What's a day of yours look like? What does it look like? Sure. Um, um, like, uh, so you, you wake up, you have your coffee, you do your, um, all your practices. Sure. And then, well, um, you know, well, with the, with the diet and as of lately, I, I got to admit that it hasn't been great because I've been <laughs> so focused on, on, uh, the business side of things, but that, you know, I also am a big believer in there's seasons for different reasons. I've said that before and uh, I'm not the first to say it, but you know, um, you got to put more energy into other things sometimes. Right. Um, but I always try, I always have a clean whole foods based diet, no matter what. Um, I always try to start out with a higher fat, um, breakfast, yeah. for all the cognitive benefits and you know all the other health benefits skin um hormones everything um i think that's a good idea to do and i do that pretty much all year year round unless i'm really focused on building muscle and and there's times where um i'm just taking in a lot a lot more carbohydrates when i'm focused on muscle building um and i'm actually my diet is quite similar to yours as well i actually don't metabolize a lot of saturated fat very well i have the gene i forget what it's called but where i i don't metabolize fat yeah, saturated I've fats very well yeah. Mm. yeah and on on the, on the other hand i've i tried vegan <laughs> i've tried pescatarian not nearly as long as you did because mm-hmm. i ran into those issues and i even have black interesting blood work to show how those those diets didn't work for me not that they don't work for other people, but yeah, um, no, exactly. But yeah, for yeah, me, for, for me, yeah. right. Um, so right now, I am, you know, I focus on quality protein. I always prioritize protein, and I there's some new evidence coming out to support that the recommendations are a bit low, um, and that that there it might be health, pretty interesting health benefits and we'll get into that right sarcopenia yeah, we, yeah, and <laughs> and all that but preserving muscle is is one of the healthiest things you can do so keeping proteins higher does that it also uh limits the overconsumption of energy yes. stored energy right fats and carbohydrates yes. uh, or fat fast and slow energy yeah. um so if you're satiating yourself with protein then you can tend to um you know, monitor your intake of the yeah. energy sources. Um, and so yeah, I, also some evidence showing that actually you're less likely to store extra calories from protein as fat than you are from um, other macros. Even though right. I mean, I I knew that I mean I knew about some controversial uh, tr- some controversy around these um, studies that came out. So I guess further research is needed to to confirm always. it, but always. yeah, always, but, but I guess there's, you know, there's, a, there must be a grain of truth in that because even if you think about evolution and how, you know, men, like a, how y- humans became humans, like what, w- you know, what their diet most was mostly based on, it was protein and uh, some fats and then yeah. some, uh, fruits. So, mm. I love that you introduced that idea because while I am a big believer in science and I'm, I am a scientist by trade and I think that's probably where we should usually start the science, science moves very slowly and it can, and it can sometimes be very limiting 
and we shouldn't ignore the anthropogenic uh, lens of looking at things like what did our ancestors do? Because yeah. there's that, there's validity there, I think, you know, and you, you, you have to approach that carefully as well. But also just anecdotally, how do you feel when you try these things? And yeah. I think being a self-experimenter and even trying to share that with clients to become their own scientists and and take it into their own hands is one of the most powerful things yeah, that we can I, share. I love this. Yeah, because sometimes people don't even know themselves that well. Because I right. know myself well enough to be able to tell if something is triggering any symptoms. Right. Some people, they don't even know themselves and they live with this constant bloat, like, you know, with like a constantly bloated belly yes. or, and they don't even mm -hmm. realize they're unaware. And oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, Absolutely. oh, but that's normal. No, that's not normal. That's not normal because no. that's, that's normal if it happens, you know, uh, um, after your Christmas lunch, that's normal if it happens after like you know you overate or like um you, right. you ate something that you were not supposed to eat that's okay but it right. doesn't happen every single day and some people they're, they're totally unaware so i yeah. think i believe in uh, as you said like helping people become um their own scientists like self-scientists yes or, yes elementals, yeah. and I, when I you lot, so. yeah when you make those realizations, it can be life changing. You know, I was one of those people when I was powerlifting, I was on the for, forever bulk diet where I just ate three pounds of beef and hamburger helper all day long. And, <laughs> and I thought it was normal to be completely inflamed, have brain fog. Yeah. Um, you know, my joints ached all the time and I was just, you know, a swollen mess. You know, I thought that was normal. And, and it's just like, oh man, how much damage did I do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, um, don't so. worry, it's never too late to right. recover. And, yeah. it, and like you said too, uh, you know, it's okay once in a while. I love the you know eighty twenty, or maybe depends on the person's perspective. Maybe yeah. ninety ten, ninety ten might be a better thing to tell people <laughs> sometimes, but. You know, I you have to live and enjoy life. On, yeah, sorry. And I think it depends on our, in, like, I'm, I'm a very strict person. So I tend to, like, for me, 90-10 is more than enough for my own right. balance. But there are people who need, who need more flexibility, I guess, for their overall, you know, balance. And I would argue health because I think, I mean, I think if you feel unhappy, then you're also you might you're more likely to end up unhealthy too in the long term. So I think it's all mm. a matter of balance. Mm -hmm. So I mean, for some people it should be eighty twenty, for some others ninety ten, uh, maybe right. even seventy thirty. Like if you come from, uh, I, I think it also depends on your background, on your his history. Like if you come from a very mm. uh, uneducated, you know history of food like when you you know you grew up all, on um, junk food all day then even like 60 40 is already an achievement i believe and then you can yeah. move up to 70 30 and then then let's see but absolutely yeah. and celebrate the small wins too it's so important to enjoy the process and the journey and and uh yeah i can't agree with that statement more that's that's wonderful thank you Thank you. So, okay. So, you, and, and um, what time do you train usually, like in your day? What time of day? Um, yeah. Uh, and this is based on research I haven't vetted myself, but I just from following, you know, people like Ben Greenfield no. um, and others, uh, I, I, somewhere I heard two o'clock is one of the more optimal, yeah, yeah. optimal times of day to train. Uh, I try to do that as much as possible. Again, that's, you know, sometimes focusing on the minutia, but, and it depends on the season I'm in, right? Right now, I'm just, I'm just doing what I can to, to yeah. stay in shape because shape I'm focused on so many other things. But, you know, most of the year, I'm trying to optimize my health and body 100%. So usually I'll go strength train around 2 p.m. Um, right Right now, in most of the year, I have three to four strength training days, um, and generally, are 
I'm always somewhat more focused on hypertrophy as well. Um, That's good. Yeah. And I stay in a range there. Um, you know, specificity is important for me, um, depending on what I'm doing. But I try to stay within, you know, rep ranges of six to 15 reps, yeah. you know, throughout the year. And I think different movements and different body parts respond better. Yes. Um, I also do a lot of work with my clients in terms of like finding the right exercise for them, which muscles fire are firing correctly from the making sure the targeted muscles are firing correctly and then playing around with different ways of doing different exercises to really focus on that mind and muscle connection. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, right now I, though, I'm, I'm doing a lot of functional at home training, uh, train with the kettlebells, which looks so cool on Instagram. Like, <laughs> uh, well, I, just a disclaimer i only put the coolest stuff i'm doing on instagram so it's I mean, not who always that cool who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no but yeah. you're, i mean where, where did you learn you know how to use kettlebells like that did you um, do special training um i did yeah um it started kind of when i was powerlifting too as, as accessory work yeah um and i got just really interested in, in kettlebells early on, um, really before they started showing up in the U S I would say, uh, I bought a few DV DVDs, um, you know, and, and definitely gravitated towards the Russian kettlebell style. Yes. That's how we, um, we kind of learned to, even though we're not as skilled as you, but yes, the, <laughs> we had these very, and, very old videos and yeah. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. And, and I think, you know, for me and, uh, I, I've always been very focused on the kinesthetic awareness. So I, I find that I can learn really well from videos and visually and, and make those small tweaks. I did, um, I never took a certification for kettlebells. I did go to a gym, however, in uh, San Diego when I was in the, in the military that, um, and I forget the name of the gym, but it was this, it was the coolest gym I've ever been to. The, the guy who owned it was from Russia and it oh. was just this rugged looking gym, had all this strong man equipment, logs, you know, uh, Atlas <laughs> yeah. stones. And then the upstairs was literally like a 20 by 20 room just with kettlebells lying all over the floor. Whoa. And Whoa. they did have some pretty advanced certifications. Like, you know, uh, they were, they were too expensive at the time for me. They're yeah, a couple yeah. thousand dollars. Um, but I, I went there and I just started watching everybody and seeing what they were doing. And, you know, this guy had been an Olympic lifter and then transitioned to kettlebells. So I just, I just spied on everybody and then, you know, implemented it into my practices. And, and I, I, I'm sure you can share this same uh, passion for wanting to do things the best or wanting to yeah, really, yeah. really like, be become an authority or somebody who really knows the, the practice inside and out you know yeah, so. yeah i don't like being average or having like average knowledge on anything right like uh, if right. i need something I, I need to go all the way through it you know till i become like a world expert or yeah yeah and, just for myself, I guess, I guess it's the same for you. Cause I, I, I don't really seek, you know, um, acknowledgement or I, I don't care about that, but mm -mm. I, I, I really take, you know, a great pleasure in um, learning. Like, uh, right. In the, in the knowing, right. It's, yes. it's, uh, it's nice. I, I enjoy mm. that a lot. So yeah, ever since then kettlebells has, have always been a part of my, my programming for myself. Um, I don't have all my clients do them. There is a, quite a bit of a learning curve. Um, mm, yeah. so, sometimes some people who aren't as kin kinesthetically aware, um, you know, may need more hands on uh, attention for that. But um, I, I have an exercise uh, video library that I, mm -hmm. oops, lost you. Yeah, no, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> I may have to take my uh, headphones out and, Mm. plug in my phone here yeah. um but yeah anyways um i think when you can when you can implement them correctly they're one of the most versatile tools that you can have and i mean 
one kettlebell is a gym. You can you can do it all really yeah. with a kettlebell. So yeah, it's a wonderful tool. Yeah, that's cool. So shall we talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, muscle mass for longevity and um, of strength training and power training? Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's I, what that's yeah. what brought us together. Arguably. Yeah, exactly. That's so exactly. So I prepared some. Uh, a, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, share the um, What is it? Yeah. Okay. Is it? Let me. Um, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Um, can you see the? Because I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. So I prepared. Um, I mean, a few like ten ar articles. Just to show, uh, okay, these are sort of introductory ones, so I'm not going to really um, dwell on them. It was just to show that these studies exist, showing a certain correlation between uh, sarcopenia, um, mm -hmm. understood as loss of muscle mass and mortality in the elderly population. Right. So um, these studies are not very the, the the problem with these studies is that the the the, the population is not very it, it's it's usually um a very small one let me see if i can find how many yeah like a, yeah it's like a 345 subjects in these studies mm -hmm. and um so that, that there might not be you know enough telling of there, it might not be reflected enough the um, the actual uh, um situation but that that's interesting um this one mm -hmm. came out in 2013 there's another one uh, there are a couple of studies yeah this one was done in italy and it was mm -hmm. looking at uh sarcopenia and mortality risk in frail older persons persons aged 80 years and older but again, mm -hmm. the, the actual population didn't take, you know, into account too many individuals. It was just, uh, yeah, 300. So the 364. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, there, yeah. and I've got another one. Yeah, again, uh, 122. But I mean, that, that's interesting because, as you said, a study doesn't have to be 100% scientific to... Mm -hmm speak the truth because that's something that you can uh, think about with your common sense because sometimes we try to be as scientific as possible because that's what we believe you know is good for us because we we live in this modern society where everything has to be mm -hmm. evidence-based and uh, scientific but, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but i don't think you know forgetting about common sense is um mm -hmm. And, and also just clear examples of populations that exist, much like the blue zones where, yeah. you know, um, they reflect a, a, a strong, uh, you know, resilient elderly population. And what are the practices and, and cultures or traditions that they are doing that contributes to that, you know, um, or what are, what, you know, we can look at the West and say, well, what are we doing wrong? Yeah, exactly. You know, but I think, well. yeah, but th that's the, the, um, the goal of um, epidemiological studies. Like when you, yes. you compare like these large figures and because that's, that, that prepares the field for um, trial studies. So that, that's helpful right. because it can really help, help you hi isolate more variables to be looked at um, into detail, like in further um, studies. So yeah, like uh, once you isolate the um, variables, and and then you can decide, you know, what to look at um, more deeply, like in further studies. So so one hundred percent. Yeah. So these are helpful tools. So um, these are some of the studies that you mentioned. Uh, so I don't have permission to, but I think you can. See. Yeah. So this one. Uh, Okay, so this is um, one study on um, sta okay standard resistance training. Is that the uh, hand grip study? I uh, let me not okay. the hand grip because uh, sorry, let me lower this. Yeah, because yeah, because the zoom bar keeps coming 
up keeps keeps showing and I can't yeah. The hand grip one should be this one. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, uh, no, this is the are you uh, looking at the so functional this, benefit of power training? Is this one? Yeah, I was looking at that one, but I guess what is the hand grip one? I can't find it. Uh, uh, oh. This one. I might have lost yes, that one. Found it. Found it. Found it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so do you want to talk about them? Because th this one I actually found quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I have some uh, <laughs> some thoughts, like I, I'm not 100% convinced about hand grip as a, you know, I mean, no, okay. I think you can use hand grip to measure strength in the average population. I think it might define... Um, threshold between uh, someone with a decent um, strength uh, level. Oh, yeah. But I don't know, like I use straps all the time, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I might not be as strong as someone who doesn't. But right. So I, I agree. Are we going to measure muscle mass or are we going to measure strength? And uh, so, I mean, let, let, let's go ahead and let's discuss these studies. because Certainly, we, yeah. And, and, you know, there's so many nuances there, too, with the hand grip. I, it, can, it can point us in a, in a direction, certainly. But even in, a, in somebody who's powerlifting, for instance, and their nervous system is taxed all the time, their, their hand grip mm -hmm. can be amazingly strong one day and the next yeah. can be fairly weak. So um, I know that there's, there's some new emerging science coming out um, that it, is, uh, I, and I need to do more research in, into this, but it looks promising in terms of, actually being able to measure expected life, you know, uh, lifespan um, rather than just following a population yeah. of individuals till their death certificate, you know? Um, and uh, certainly there's some, there's some pretty amazing people leading that research, like uh, Dr. David Sinclair. Yes. And, uh, um, that looks promising, but yeah, definitely a subject I want to look, more into but i mean there's certainly a pretty staggering body of evidence to to show at least the correlation between sarcopenia and early death yeah. you know um and yeah and you mentioned you know what are we doing should we be measuring muscle mass and you know that leads me to think about you know what are the recommendations for muscle mass we don't have any yeah. We, we certainly have uh, uh, recommendations for body fat levels and adipose fat tissue and how much we should be carrying and how that's related to, to, uh, to longevity. But we really don't have anything to, sh to tell us how much muscle we should be carrying throughout our entire life, you know. And I think there needs to be more research based on that because we know sarcopenia is not a good thing for life. Life yeah, no, exactly. And, and, so, how do we combat that? Yeah, and, and also, I think, I mean, eventually we'll all die, right? And uh, most likely, we, we will all die from sarcopenia because one way or another, we'll, we'll end up losing muscle. But one sure. thing is uh, losing muscle when you're 99, one thing is losing muscle when you're 65. Yeah, or so, younger. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. So that, right. that, that's, I think, the, the, the most uh, important thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I guess, I mean, when I was looking at um, some other studies um, yesterday, which um, the system won't allow me to get, you know, to look at anymore because I don't have permission to, so I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, something that, that surprised me was that some of these studies were not well constructed, well, not, not well designed, in my opinion, because they didn't. Mm -hmm. So they said, so this is the one I was talking about. And he wanted to compare power training with strength oh, right. training and just uh, aerobic training in an elderly population. But the way they designed those um, um, strength training programs, it just didn't look like strength training to me. It, looks, it looked right. like... Uh, normal resistance training because it was uh, mm -hmm. like a 70 percent um, one rm and it was like um higher repetition so it's not proper strength training right so, and, and the uh, power was the same the, the, power, the power was yeah 
Right. And they were doing, you know, knee extensions or something. And just yeah, exactly. Change, okay, yeah, it was knee extension. the tempo. Yeah. So how can you, a leg press. So, yeah. Yeah. So, right. I mean, I, I know where, where they were, you know, I, I could say where, you, I could see where they were coming from, but right. I, I don't think it's accurate because the, that, that was just, you know, com, like just plain resistance training and yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where I, I yeah. try to look at examples, like who are some fit old, old guys and women who are doing power training or strength training and they're they're like quality of life is super high and they, yeah there we go yes, yes. um you know um and ben greenfield actually published an article that was something like the six fittest old guys in the world or something and i thought it was great because they were all sharing just their lifestyle practices and yeah for me that's that's sometimes that's all i need to hear what are those yeah. people doing right like exactly let's just, yes let's, let's copy that Unfortunately, we don't have a giant population of uh, people in their 70s and 80s who are just doing, you know, clean and jerks all day long. And then <laughs> another group who's doing, you know, squat, that, that, bench, deadlift. Yeah, that, that's the problem. Um, yes. But right. I mean, obviously, if you train for power, you might be more functional just because of the, you know, the, the I mean, the energy system it involves and, the, you know, because mm -hmm. you, you train for speed and uh, strength at the same time and you try to yeah. maximize your, um, your speed force. So, you, I mean, obviously you're more functional, but yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, you're more functional, but you might, I mean, does that mean that you're going to live longer than someone with just more muscle mass? Probably not. Like you, 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 you're just, right. you're just gonna live more independently, possibly. Mm -hmm. But right. yeah, but you might still, you know, run into sarcopenia if you don't uh, build enough muscle too. Right. And I'm I think there's a balance for sure. From mm -hmm. just, you know, if I check out on my scientific thinking, it it's just like you said, common sense. It seems to point towards a balance of m muscle functionality and, you know, muscle recruitment and, you know, uh, because sarcopenia is essentially inhibition of muscle, you know, it's, yeah. it's decreased muscle mass, but it's also less of, uh, you know, functional muscle, right? It's, yes. it's the inability to fire the muscles and the connection between the brain and the muscle. Yeah. And, um, so you have to have both. So, so you have to have enough muscle to be fired, to be connected, and then you have to be the ability uh, to, to fire those muscles uh, efficiently, I would say. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So that, that's very, that, that's interesting. And, um, and as you mentioned earlier, I wanted to go back, that we, we have a bunch of studies showing, uh, um, you know, like um, acceptable levels for body fat percentage but not right. that much for, for muscle mass. Uh, and that's, that's important also because they go hand in hand sometimes because usually the more muscle you carry, the leaner you, you tend to get. Yes, um, yes. Unless you're yes. on a constant bulk like for years and years, but usually like uh, when you reach your homeo homeostasis, let's, let's call it this way, mm -hmm. and uh, usually if you're muscular enough, you're also lean enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. Your metabolism is firing way yeah. more efficiently, the more muscle you have. Right. That's why I, I thought, you know, power and, and, uh, some volume training as well, or hypertrophy training, because you can, you can stave off the accumulation of adipose fat tissue much easier when you have, are carrying more muscle. You yeah. know, um, yeah, yeah. this is, something I try to work towards with all my clients to make them realize. And, you know, and also the, we can talk about what, you know, not only does it create having the muscle create a higher, more efficient metabolism, but the, the workouts strength training itself, you're utilizing epoch or uh, excess yeah. post oxygen consumption, which is the afterburn, right? Your yes. hours after the workout, you're still burning. Um, so that's why I'm like, you know, um, 
not a big proponent of long duration chronic cardio and you know uh, i like utilizing those techniques more i don't know if, if you i'm guessing you no i use agree similar 100 i mean unless you want to train for that because um absolutely like i have a client who wants to be able to run 10k right so right. that's his goal i'm training him for for that because that's what he wants to do so yeah uh, if he if he just came to me asking like, uh, I just want to be, I want, I want to live longer then I wouldn't probably advise, you know, that he trained for 10 K. Uh, but yeah, like, right. but again, it's a matter of balance, right? So if you, if running 10 K, it makes you feel happy and for mm. you, then go for it. Like, you know, also because you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like you, you can, uh, I think what this pandemic has taught us is that some things, you know, always happen which are out of control. And mm. um, as much, you know, as much as we can be prepared for them, we'll never be fully prepared for anything, you know, in life. So just do what really makes you happy, but be mindful of um, long-term consequences. I don't know if it, if it makes any sense, but I guess that's kind of my, you know, oh, yeah. philosophy. Like I try to, like, like, you know, I try to think as if I could live forever, but I also try to live as if I was dying tomorrow or, you know, something like that. <laughs> as someone that yes. Oh, that's like the best thing to yeah. tell, to share. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's balance, right? Like, you know, doing what makes you happy is so important if, if it gives you a se sense of purpose and meaning and you enjoy it then it's and it's healthy then yeah. you should be doing it right yeah, exactly. and, um, if, but also if, like, if right. you want to smoke you don't know 20 packets of cigarettes a day maybe i wouldn't advise like go for it maybe you should quit smoking but if right. running more or less makes you happy just, what's the difference after all and yeah also, what, what, what would the alternative be? Would you maybe sit on the couch in front of, you know, your TV and right. eating crisps or, you know, like, uh, so maybe even running a marathon <laughs> would be healthier than that. So, yeah. yeah. And, and not everybody needs to or, or wants to, like, be so focused on the optimal, you know, everything. Yeah. Like, like, you know, leave, leave that up to the... The to trainer, who wants to yeah, exactly yeah. yeah you know yeah. and certainly i have clients that want to know more and they, they get you know i'll share i don't ever send them scientific literature but <laughs> i'll share a podcast or we'll discuss you know different yeah. ideas other other clients they got better things to do they just want to focus on their business and and have you be the one that takes care of that part of their life and that's fine i think that's wonderful we, i you know we all need to lean on each other more and um and share our gifts and and uh yeah i, I love this i love doing this yeah because it's all about relationships at the end because we are a community and um and as we yes. as we said before even from a an evolutionary perspective it makes sense because our ancestors used to live in tribes and used to gather together. And I think up, up until recently, like maybe one century ago, people were still living in a more um, communitarian sort of way. Like they would um, share more, yeah, they would just um, spend more time together. They would share more activities. And mm -hmm. um, it's been, I, I don't think it's been more than 100 years since we started to, part you know from yes so yeah and that that uh, leads me to you know again we're talking so much about mindset and and you know doing things that that encourage a healthy mindset you know and that is such an important part and that's something later in life that i have more, more as i get older i realize that more and more how how important the the connection is and the sense of community and you know, fostering meaningful, healthy interactions. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I talked, I talk about the blue zones a lot. Um, and, and the, uh, 
another thing that they all share in common is that strong sense of family and community. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's that holistic, all encompassing mindset that, you know, we need to get away from those days of just beating ourselves up in the gym. And, you know, um, I mean, there's a season for everything too, but you know, if, if you're interested in maintaining a, a sustainable, healthy lifestyle, it can be done, you know? Yes. Uh, I love this. Uh, I think we should yeah, wrap this up because it's been already one hour and uh, 15 minutes. I, I think sure. yeah, it's been enough for our audience, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I definitely want to do another one with you soon, if you agree. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Anytime I can chat with you, yeah, I'd gladly. So, cool. so um, where can, I mean, I'm going to put your um, contact details in the show notes, but where can uh, sure. people find you if they want to? Sure. I, I'm only using Instagram at the moment. Um, it's about all I can handle. I'm still uh, very uh, social media illiterate. I'm working yeah. on it. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I really like using that platform. It seems to foster really good, meaningful interactions. Um, so my uh, my Instagram is wildmanstrengthpt. Um, and I should have the link in my bio for the ebook on there uh, today. Um, and yeah, other and than that... the 9th of July because when the podcast will be released, it will be already... Um... I mean, your oh, right. book will be already out. So, uh, sure. yeah, but so today's the 9th of July for us. <laughs> so, uh, right, right. <laughs> clarify, sorry. No worries. Um, yeah, so um, that's something that I just want to encourage people to use and I hope it can help whoever. It's a simple, uh, easy to digest guide. Not, you know, um, it's only a few pages long, so. But other than that, you you know, people can always reach out to me through the DMs on Instagram or uh, my email, which is wildmanstrengthpt at gmail.com. Okay, I love this. Just the last three questions that I ask everyone. So sure. Yeah, so uh, question number one, last book you read. Question number two, last, eat, last me- meal you ate. And uh, last body part you trained. <laughs> That, those, that's a good one so in book this, uh, meal field. and uh, training basically. so let me grab the book I'm reading uh, and I, I generally read two books at a time so maybe I'll share both um, where is it I like to read something that's a little either like historical fiction or history or something at night before I go to bed oh, nice. so I've been reading a, a friend of mine gave me this book a tough trip through paradise. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's, um, it's really interesting. It's actually based on a true, uh, oops, I think I lost you. Are you there? Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's just a fun read. It, it's, uh, kind of a, it, somebody, the author found it, the journals of the man who, who was in this book living in Montana during the late 1800s as a actually as like a fur trader and it's just like a really interesting window into that time period so that's been fun but then uh as you know i've been reading um emerson yes lately and uh i emerson here as well just (laughs) oh yeah and uh nature was the one i i started with this is the second time i read it but this time i I, I read it and consumed it a lot better, I think. And really, you, you got to read Emerson a little slow and take your time to yeah. reflect on He really tries to, he puts these profound messages out and just assumes that the reader is going to make sense of it. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and I, I would have something to say that just uh, not enough time, but let, yeah. let, let's do another one and we'll mention. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to have more of a philosophy discussion with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, let, let's go next time. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and, so uh, that's what I'm reading. Uh, my meal this morning is um, actually, I just made a shake. And it's like a superfood uh, green shake. I've been actually using a 
Purium products uh, lately. I don't know if you've heard of them, um, but they make it. They're a good transparent company that makes um, these really good nourishing shakes. So I, I put a little bit of whey in there as well, mm -hmm. and because um, I was just jamming trying to prepare for this. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, usually, last, yeah. Yeah, go usually ahead. though, eggs are always in my breakfast. Eggs. Uh, I love eggs. Uh, poach them with a little bit of salsa uh, usually or something like that so yeah keep it i'm gonna have duck eggs now for um, dinner because i got a lot of duck eggs oh i love duck yeah. eggs yes they're so nutritious yeah. and so I, i don't i don't know we just love them we buy them from the farmer's market you know every sunday mm. the guy actually keeps the three boxes for us so he knows so every time you know he, he sees me he just hands me <laughs> these three boxes of um, duck eggs. Yeah. Oh, I love it, man. The farmer's markets are great. That's another topic for a good discussion. Is, yes. Uh, yeah. Local food systems. I'm so passionate about that. So. Yeah, we, we, yeah me, me too. Actually, me too. We should, yeah, we should definitely, we, 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 we need to do more than one, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And, yeah. So last spot And, you trained, yes. Um, so let's see. Yesterday, I just did a full body circuit with my kettlebells, um, uh, kind of a mix of ballistic, uh, the, the ballistic exercises like the snatch and the cleans yeah. and everything and uh, threw in some sandbag density training and that was it. That video, I think. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> with the overhead squats and yes, and, I yeah, love so. That's a good one. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I love the sandbag. You can, you can take it with you to the end of the earth and still get really strong with it. So, you know, it's a good one. So, yeah. 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 I love this. Okay. So thank, thank you so much for coming really. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. having you here. Um, Gaia, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful speaking with you and I just, I love sharing these ideas with, everyone and I, I'm really thankful and grateful for the uh, opportunity.